Father, thank you that a day is coming when we will stand in your presence and the truth that we have eternally been yours will be evident and you will eternally be ours. And we long for that day, that day when your grace is unleashed upon us and we realise just the amazing riches and depth of your grace to us uh, in our lives, that sinners like us might know you and be loved by you and be kept for you. And we pray tonight as we pray and read and discuss, um, pray that your grace would uh, be abundantly clear to us. Um, even now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue our series in Matthew's Gospel. We're in Matthew chapter 19. Um, we're starting at verse 16. Don't worry, I know there's some pedants here who will notice that we've skipped verses 13 to 15. We'll come back to them next week. We're going to dive in in um, um, Matthew 19 verse 16. Uh, Lydia's going to um, read it for us from Matthew chapter 19 um, verse 16. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honour your father and mother, and love your neighbour as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. <clears throat> Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or fields for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Father God, we thank you so much for this time to meet together. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it is true and that it's always um, useful for us to hear from you and hear what you have to say into our lives. We pray that you would help us to concentrate now with so much going on in our minds, so much um, maybe that we're finding difficult at the moment. We thank you that your word is still relevant today. And uh, we pray that you'd help us to focus on what you're saying to us, that you would help John T to speak clearly uh, and for us to be able to listen attentively and to be changed and transformed by your word, not just to hear it now and to to go away and forget, but to hear it and be transformed by what you say to us through it. Amen. Amen. Our question for this evening is this. Why is good not good enough for God? Why is good not good enough for God? Uh, maybe you're here and you're just looking into the Christian faith and you know at the heart of the Christian faith is this claim that we are flawed um, and fallen people who need a salvation from God, we need forgiveness from God. But when you look at yourself you realise, okay I'm not perfect but I don't feel like I would call myself a sinner. I don't feel like I need something to happen, something to be taken away from me in order that I might know God? Why isn't good good enough for God? That's a question that you'll definitely be asked if you're a follower of, of Christ for that very reason. Most people think that they're not perfect, but why do they need someone to die for them in order that God might be in a relationship with him? What's your answer to that? What do you say when people ask you that question? Because you will be asked that one day, why isn't good good enough 
to God? And I guess if we've been a Christian for a while, we've probably got an answer to that. Something about the holiness of God, something about the standards of God, something about what he requires from people. And there are all sorts of ways that we could answer that question. But I wonder if you guys are anything like me, and I don't presume that you are. Um, I wonder if sometimes you meet someone who's not a believer and something in their lives just challenges your answer to that question. I've had two things recently. One one is just um, a friend of mine who I've kept in contact with since um, school days. Um, and he's undoubtedly the nicest person I know. He's not, he's not a Christian, uh, but he's just kind, generous, loves his family, works hard, and just so thoughtful. Um, as things happen in your life, he, he'll be the first to send you a message to say he's thinking of you. He, he goes to church as well. He wouldn't call himself a believer, but a religious guy. And sometimes looking at his life, I think to myself, why isn't that good enough for God? Does he really need someone to die for him in order for him to have a relationship with God? Or there's another guy um, who, who um, sadly passed away this year, actually. Um, I knew him from Birmingham. He was a, a brother of a friend. And he was a he was a plumber, and he used to do work uh, around the house for us. Um, uh, and again, uh, uh, just a lovely guy who'd do anything for anyone almost. Um, once our, our water um, water froze and then burst in the middle of the night, and he came out the next morning, no extra charge, and just pulled it out for us. Um, and particularly when he when he died, actually, um, I, I was just struck by the sense of sadness. This is a, a good guy. Um, why isn't his life in all the kind of other person's centeredness that he exuded? Why isn't it good enough for God? Why isn't good good enough for God? Well, I think if we lived in the first century, the people we would have asked that question about would have been the Jewish religious leaders. Um, if you've been a Christian for a while, you, you read the Bible and you think they're the bad guys. They're the kind of people who, when they get on the stage, we all kind of boo. Um, but that's the reason why most of the, the Gospels don't really make sense to us, because actually these were the good guys. If you're a keen Jewish mum, you wanted your son to become one of them, you wanted your daughters to marry them. If you were writing out the family kind of Christmas letter, and one of your um, sons became a Pharisee or a scribe or one of the teachers of the law, uh, you would have half a page about how proud you were of them. If you read what Jesus says about them, particularly in these chapters, chapters 19 to 23, you can see why. Jesus says that they were good guys. They were serious about the Bible. They were serious about evangelism. They were serious about obedience. Even in the fun, in the fun, the new details of their life, they wanted to be obedient to the word of God. And if you looked at them, they would look like paragons of virtue. Jesus says they appear to be um, righteous. They appear to people to be as righteous. If you were a godly Jew, it was their synagogues that you wanted to go to. It would be their books that you wanted to read, their blogs that you were following avidly. And here's the thing, they rejected Jesus, and more importantly, Jesus rejected them. And the question that I'm sure would have troubled you in the first century is why? Why aren't these guys good enough for God? Same question for me, why aren't so many of our friends good enough for God. And that's why I think sometimes we're tempted to walk away from the Christian life. We think maybe they are good enough for God. Maybe this whole thing's just kind of hoax. What's wrong with these people? Well, last week, as we just had a sneak preview at the end of the, this little section, um, at Jesus' um, um, tirade against the religious leaders in chapter 23. We've got some of the answer. Jesus said this in chapter 23, verses 25 to 26. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. And what Jesus was saying, they, they look so holy, but actually in their hearts, they're obsessed with sex and money. And here's the thing we really need to understand, and we're going to see today, it's possible to look very religious, respectable, and righteous, and governed by an obsession 
with sex we saw last week and with money and with wealth and all that it can offer you. And what we're going to see today in this passage is that it's not just tragic when that happens. Actually, it's morally heinous. There's nothing more awful than having your life governed um, by money. And so we're going to look at two things that Jesus says, two statements that Jesus makes, which hopefully going to help us get our heads around this. And the first we're going to look at is the problem of being rich. The problem of being rich, looking at um, verses 16 um, to 24. So everyone knows that being rich can multiply your problems. The more you have, the more you have to worry about. But I think few realise what Jesus is saying in this passage. Here Jesus meets a man who isn't spiritually half-hearted by any measure. Um, look down at verse 16. This guy is hungry for eternal life. Teach him what good thing must I do to get eternal, eternal life? He wants to know Jesus. He wants to know the life beyond this life with God. And he thinks that Jesus might be the key to that. Look at verse 20. Asked about um, some of the commandments that Jesus lists. This guy says, I've done them all. In fact, you can say, I've loved my neighbour as myself which Jesus asked him about in verse 19. This man thinks he's a good guy, and I think we would have agreed. See, when Jesus replied to him in verse 18, look, you need to keep the commandments, and then the guy says, which one? Jesus lists six of the ten commandments, and he lists these six in particular because this guy has done them. We've got no reason to believe that he was making it up. He hadn't murdered or committed adultery or stolen or given false testimony. And he had honoured his mother and father. And to all intents and purposes, he had loved his neighbour as himself. He had done them, which is why Jesus picks them. Jesus wants the disciples and us to see he really was a good guy. He thinks he's good. And he would want to have been seen to be good. His friends, his family, wider society would have thought this is a good guy. The disciples would have thought he was good. But Jesus had questions. One of the terrifying things about God and Jesus because he was God is that he could just read you like a book. Uh, he knows exactly what's going on in your mind. Your Moses is implicit, and sometimes this is explicit. Jesus knew what was going on in everyone's mind, even before they said it. And he knew this man better than this man knew himself. It's terrifying. Imagine being in a relationship with someone like that. So Jesus puts his finger on the issue in this guy's life. Verse 21, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. It's easy to get fixated on the first half of verse 21, which is pretty shocking. The house, the car, the golf clubs, your favourite pair of earrings if you're a woman, that cheeky little savings account that your parents put away from you, away for you, uh, your wedding presents, said it all. Put it on eBay. Remember a few years ago, that's what Ian Usher did. And after his marriage fell apart, he, he sold his life to kind of start again. I think he started, wanted to travel or something. And he got just under uh, half a million, uh, I think it was US dollars, for all that he owns. That's a massive thing to do. It is a massive thing to do. The ultimate fresh start. We get fixated on the first half of the verse, but... Let's not forget that there is something in it for him. He's told he will have eternal treasure and he will follow Jesus. He'll be part of this new Jesus movement that Jesus has created. And so he's given this dilemma. You can have everything that you have. Or you can have eternal um, treasure and me. Which one do you want? Jesus asks. What do you think you would have done? If you were him. Everything that you own now. Maybe isn't that much. Or Jesus and everything that he could give you in the future. But this man walks away. And here's why we're told in verse 22. 
because he was rich. Because he had great wealth. And so we get Jesus' first principle in verse 23. Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. The problem with being rich is that money can be your God and Jesus will have absolutely no rivals. You see, money offers us many of the things that God offers us. Identity, security, pleasure, hope, insurance. And Jesus has already said in Matthew's Gospel and the Sermon on the Mount, you can't have two masters. He puts it like this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot. You might think you can, but you cannot. One day there will conflict and you'll have to make a choice. And this is what happens to this man on this very day. And Jesus here audaciously says, I am that God who you cannot two time, and I will have no rivals. Either you can have your under half a million dollars worth of stuff, or you can have me. And you see the outrage of what this guy says in response. This man looks at his just under half a million dollars worth of stuff, and then looks into the eyes of Jesus, the maker of this universe, the sustainer of the billions of stars and planets and galaxies. And he says, I'll, I'll take the money, please. And I hope you feel something of the sense of what he's done there. It's not just a bad um, kind of accounting decision, although it is. Treasures which last for, what, 70 years versus treasures which last for eternity. That's a stupid accounting decision. It's not just a stupid accounting decision. It's the height of law breaking. The first command is what? Have no God beside me. It's blasphemy. It's idolatry. It's an act of defamation on the character and the value and the worth of God. And it's, in, it's of cosmic proportions. decision he will regret forever. Money can be a god as it was for him. And Jesus says, as God on earth, I will have no rivals. Choose. Choose. I want us to get into groups for a few moments and just chat about the different reasons that people present for why they reject God. Um, what are the different reasons that people present? Either ones that you've come across or ones that you've heard of and just quickly how do you respond how do you respond if someone says actually i think there's it's not historical or i think it's anti-science or oh. so what are the different um the kind of issues that people bring up in terms of why they don't want to follow jesus and how do you respond um let's have five minutes in our groups and then we'll come back and chat about that is that right Lisa? Right. Um, there are all sorts of reasons that people give um, for not wanting to follow Christ, aren't there? And maybe a couple of people just shout out a, a couple that you've um, mentioned in your groups. I'm not feeling bold. They feel they don't need God. Yeah. Yeah, they feel they don't need God. Um, so wh whatever it is, their life seems to be working, they seem to be happy. They think they can achieve their goals without God. Yeah. Any others? Thanks, mate. Mike. Um, I was just saying I uh sorry, I'm new, I'm a non believer. Um right. sorry. Um and I was saying I wish I could believe in God, but I don't know how to do that. I think my life would be better if I could, but I don't know how I can 
convinced myself of that. I hope that's okay. Yeah, that's really helpful. And many, many people find that, that it just seems so alien um, or just they just don't know what to, to do. And they, they see something attractive in the Christian life, but they're not sure how to move towards it and don't know whether they, they want to. Um, and that would be something we could talk about in, in question time. And so there, there are lots of different reasons that people present um, for, um, I guess, not like um, that last person you spoke, who seems to be looking for um, a way into the Christian faith, but people who want to walk away from the Christian faith present all sorts of reasons. And I think Jesus is saying here, many of them are actually smoke screens. Actually, the big issue is that they don't want to change their lives. They've got something which works for them as a God. And so they don't want to convert to a, another God. And money is often a big reason or a big surrogate God or kind of um, replacement God that works for many people. And Jesus says it twice because he wants us to be really clear. It's hard for rich people to become Christians. It's hard like getting the biggest animal you could think of, kind of domestic animal in the first century, a camel, through the smallest hole you can think of, through a, a needle. It's hard. The more people have, the harder it will be. So we're saying Jesus isn't anti-money. There are plenty of people who are rich. We see Joseph of Arimathea as someone who buries Jesus at, uh, at the end of his life. He's a rich man. There's plenty of people who are rich who follow Jesus. Also, also we're saying that no one else apart from this guy in the New Testament is asked to give up everything. Practically, no one's asked to give up everything um, to follow, follow Jesus. But this man's asked because Jesus wants to highlight to him how important money is for him. But all of us will be asked to give up something. We saw that last week. People giving up things for the sake of the kingdom. And it's worth saying, if you're not willing to give up anything, follow Jesus, then you know you have no idea what's being offered to you from Jesus. Someone once said money often costs too much, and for this guy it will cost him um, everything. The problem with being rich, rich is that money is a god and Jesus will have no rivals. But here's the thing, if you were in this situation, what would you have done? Let me give a, a different scenario. Imagine God made it abundantly clear that he wanted you to do another job in another country in order that you might share the gospel with people who don't know it. And that would mean that your lifestyle would be substantially different. Imagine if he made it abundantly clear that was his will for your life. That's what following him would mean for you. Would you do it? Or if he said, actually, I want you to leave your blossoming banking career in order to be a kind of um, operations manager like JDM, who well, I presume doesn't get paid like a central London banker, though I don't know that. Um, but would you would you do it like a friend of mine has? Or maybe even more simply, imagine if God made it abundantly clear to you that he wanted you to become a ministry trainee and to forgo that plum grad job that you are lining up for yourself. Would you do it? If God said, this is my will for you, would you do it? I, I think it's rare that God actually does make it abundantly clear that he wants you to do this and nothing else as a matter of personal obedience. I think that is pretty rare. But I think imagining if it was the case is quite helpful. But it reminds us actually it's, it's hard to give up a lifestyle and, and money and all the things that come with it. And if you think it's hard for us in the 21st century, imagine what it was like for Peter all those years ago, which is why he has this wobble in verse 27. He says, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be uh, for us? Jesus said that good people, rich people like this guy, well, they can't get in without a supernatural work of God. If, if that guy wasn't to get into heaven, something amazing would have to work in his heart, God will have to change his heart, which gets Peter's mind going. Well, maybe if it takes that much of a miracle to change my mind about God, maybe that's because actually it doesn't make sense. And so he asked an outrageous question. I can't believe he asked this. What then will there be for us? If someone asks you out, asks you to go out with them romantically, you don't respond to them, well, what's in it for me? Or if someone asks you to, to move in with them, you don't respond to them, what's in it for me? 
there's Jesus just matches the Christ verse in chapter 16. The Christ, the Messiah's intention, saying, right, follow me. And Jesus responds to him and says, well, what's in it? What's in it for me? I've given my life for you. What's in it for me? I think many of us think, well, surely we should just follow Jesus out of duty or out of respect or devotion. Maybe we should follow Jesus just to be with Jesus, which is true. To be with Jesus is, is the best thing in the universe. But it's interesting what Jesus says to him. Here we see something of how the Bible works and how um, Jesus works in terms of motivating us to follow him. We saw it in verse 21. He said to this man, you will have treasure in heaven. And we see it in verse um, 28. And this is our second proverb from Jesus, and our second point. The, pro the promise of following Jesus, experiencing how his salvation is worth any sacrifice. It's worth any sacrifice. Let me just read it to you. Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone, this is you and me, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Just briefly, for the twelve who are about to be cast out of Jewish society, who are about to be judged by um, their family and friends as heretics, who are about to experience dishonour for their faith and be marginalised, they told they will reign and they will honour, they'll be honoured with the greatest honour imaginable. They'll be very hard at the new gov of the new government in Jesus' new world. They will be judging the very people who judge them. And so Jesus says it's worth any sacrifice to follow me, to follow me. and for us. Jesus is saying, for Christians down the ages who follow the Messiah, some of whom it will mean leaving their family, their home, their land. We know people amongst us who have left their land and won't be able to go back because they followed Christ. Well, it won't be easy. I just read, um, I, I got sent to my, my phone on Friday morning something to pray for um, a brother in, um, in Iran. We were told that he's been locked up and um, his adopted daughter's been taken away from him. Uh, two of the grand ayatollahs in um, Iran have issued a fatwa in support of him, and yet um, nothing's happening. We're told, by the time of reading this, little Lydia has probably been in state care for nearly four months. This is in the 21st century, happening today. Some people following Christ involves massive sacrifice. And these massive sacrifices aren't our experience, but we've tasted it. The question is, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Well, here's the promise. Look at verse 29 again. You will receive a hundredfold that in this lifetime. You will gain a hundred new homes, a hundred new mothers and brothers and sisters and lands. And I've experienced this. I've experienced this becoming part of this new global family. I think you feel it most when you go abroad and you go into a church. And as soon as you um, open your mouth and some of the things that they're singing, um, which are kind of internationally known or whatever, as soon as you make it obvious that you're a Christian, uh, you realise that to them you're family and that they open up their homes to you. Um, you realise this when you're in, in trouble often and you're um, away from your uh, blood family uh, and your spiritual family gathers around and looks after you, cooks for you, prays for you. And I guess you've experienced something of this. Alicia, just give us a flavour of what people are saying in terms of some of the joys they've experienced of being part of the Christian wider family. Yeah, sure. Uh, shared experience and encouragement, knowing you can go anywhere in the world and have an immediate sense of community and people united together, having people to go through struggles with and support both emotionally and practically, whether that's with meals or coming around to fix things, 
uh, unity despite age, stage, background, race, etc. Things like that. Really helpful. And I'm sure there are many more testimonies of what it's like. You know, there's a wonderful thing uh, to be part of the family of God. I just wonder this week how you will be a fulfillment of that promise to someone that you know, whose brother or sister or mother or father you can be this week. Maybe just by sending a, a text, calling, going for a walk with someone, just checking up on someone, maybe through money or, or prayers. Or even the challenge that some of us need sometimes. Jesus says, you will have left significant things to be part of my family, but you will be part of this family. And it's a wonderful thing. And as part of this family, you stand, you stand to inherit part of the family legacy. And will inherit eternal life. Inherit is very deliberately used. Uh, Jesus isn't talking about salvation by sacrifice. If you give up lots for me, then you will earn all this kind of stuff. You will inherit it just by um, uh, default of being part of this family. We'll think more about that next week. And what is it that we will inherit? We will inherit in internal life. Life as it was in the garden, unspoilt, in perfect intimacy with God and with each other. Life as we see it kind of glimpsed in the, the high point of the kingdom of Israel. A life of plenty and of joy and of riches and of pleasure and of security and safety. Life as we see glimpsed around Jesus when he was here. A life of del delight and glory and wonder and intimacy with the one who made us and who loved us. A life in service of our King for all eternity. A life in the presence of the people that we are seeing on these screens. With our global family forever. Those who know and love Christ. Got a few moments for questions. Right, clarification on what's in it for me. Um, so, Peter's. Peter's answer, um, the answer to Peter's question is, you will get a family bigger than the one that you've lost, and houses more than the ones that you've lost, and a part in my eternal kingdom. Um, so what's in it for Peter? Uh, just the most awesome thing in the universe, being part of Jesus' kingdom. That, that, that's, that's, that's where Jesus goes, this eternal salvation. Yeah. Any other questions or comments that people have before we um, just go into groups pray? How do we convince unbelieving family members that giving up things they want um, more than God is worth it? Um, that's a that's a great question. Um, Anything to say? I think the, the big thing has got to be prayer. We have to take Jesus' first point very seriously. Um, so, twice it says, Treat you free, I tell you, and he's saying, This is really important, listen up. Uh, verse 23 It is hard for someone to enter the kingdom of um, someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And verse 26 With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. God, it, it's, it's it takes a miracle for someone to see this, so we have we have to pray. Um, I guess we need to show it in our lives as well, um, not in a kind of in-your-face way, but um, they'll see it in our decisions, kind of what what we prioritise. Um, but ultimately, I think um, we want to show them Jesus and and what he did, um, that kind of backs up his claim that ultimately what he is going to bring about in the future is worth selling everything for. Um, Jesus tells a parable of a, a merchant who finds this pearl which is of great price and it's worth selling everything for and I think as you read through the Gospels and see who Jesus is and what he's offering and his ability um, to um, do whatever he wants basically which means that he can um, fulfill his promises um, that's what the Spirit will use to open people's eyes.
um, to pray, open the Bible and, and model it in your life. Um, final question, what's the best way of sharing the gospel with someone who is simply apathetic towards the idea of God? Um, um, so this is assuming that you're praying hard for them. I guess I'm struggling to, to think of an answer because you can't force someone to care about God. Um, and I think you need to be pretty clear with them, as Jesus did. Um, what you're saying, if there's any truth in it, is of ultimate importance. That's C.S. Lewis's thing, isn't it? Either it's of ultimate importance or it's of no importance. It can't be of kind of medium level importance. Um, you need to be frank with them that uh, heaven and hell is in the balance and that. Even if there's a hint that there might be something in it, it's, it's worth investigating. Uh, and similarly, that needs to be something that you don't just say, but that, that is evident from your life as, as well. Um, but as you kind of share that, as you witness to them in, in your, your love for them and your desire to serve them, and you pray for them, there's, there's nothing much more that you can do. Um, uh, and we can be encouraged that people even look Jesus in the eye and walk away from him. So they can certainly walk away from us. Uh, we can't we can't make people um, Christians. The words of Jesus, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life but many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first father help us to believe the indestructible promise of your son uh, help it to shape our lives and shape the way that we view um, ourselves and those around us that we might be a blessing to people and, uh, and might honor you in jesus name Amen.